What we're going to talk about is freedom today. How do we make good, wise decisions in that? So with this illusion of perfection, there's a generation that sometimes is scared to make any decision at all because if I make the wrong decision, right, as if, right, as if, if I don't make the perfect decision, and so they're afraid to make an imperfect decision, and therefore we don't make any decision, which is making a poor decision, Not to decide is to decide, okay? So today we're going to talk about how do we handle it when it's difficult to decide, when it's a question of, I'm not sure, there could be many options. Where do I go to college? Should I date this person or not? Should we get married? Should we have another child? Should we buy this house or just keep renting? Should I get a car? Should I take this job? Should we move to another city? All those types of questions that we have. And there are some people who will say, well, if you're a follower of Jesus, on the big decisions like I just mentioned, God is going to show you the exact decision that you need to make. And that's where I'm going to say, hmm, well, if that's the case, let's look a little at Paul here in 1 Corinthians in a number of passages and see if that holds water with the way he, and I think of all people that I know in the New Testament outside of Jesus, which, you know, he's in a, (laughs) um, I, uh, Being the son of God, I think, you know, is a little... But with Paul, he's just a human being like us, following Jesus. And he, do you realize, he wrote the majority of the New Testament, uh, many of the New Testament books. So I think he would know how to make good or wise decisions and how to do it so that he would be following the will of God with his life. Don't you? And so let's see just how he did that and how he talked about that. And we're going to look at another passage before we get to 1 Corinthians 9. We're going to go to chapter 16 to the end of the letter. And here we see how Paul writes just about his future plans. And this is what he says. I will visit you after passing through Macedonia, for I intend to pass through Macedonia and perhaps... Isn't that an interesting word? I will stay with you or even spend the winter so that you may help me on my journey wherever I go. For I do not know, uh, do not want to see you now just in passing. I hope to spend some time with you if the Lord permits. But I will stay in Ephesus until Pentecost for a wide door for effective work has opened to me and there are many adversaries. So do you get what's going on with that? I don't think Paul's being wishy-washy. I think he is spelling it out the way it really is. And this is an apostle of Jesus Christ. This is the guy who wrote many books in the New Testament. This is the guy who gave everything uh, in his life to following Jesus. And notice he uses words like perhaps and I intend. He doesn't say I'm going to arrive on November 2nd. And I'm going to stay till March 23rd because the Lord has showed me exact, and I'm going to do this on this day and this on this day, and this is this, 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 and I know exactly what God wants me to do because that's the way God works. And it didn't work that way in his life. Now, did Paul have visions? Yes. Did he have words directed from the Lord once in a while? Yes. But the majority of his, even big decisions on where he's going to do his missionary work, where he's going to go next, he did not decide based on some crazy eight ball or some other method to try to figure out what to do. But he says things like, I intend, perhaps, Lord willing. And he gives a little reasoning in here of, I don't want to stay for a short time. I think it's going to be important to do a long time. And I'm staying here in Ephesus because there's an effective, open opportunity here, even though it's difficult. That's how he talked about it. So if Paul doesn't understand all those details that we sometimes get hung up on, why are we so hung up on them? And that's what we're talking about, like we have talked about. When you know the right who... When you become the right who, then following the do, what do I do, will make sense. And when you're living in the right why, as we said last week, the right motivation, then what you do will follow as well. And if you trust in the right whom, this is in whom I trust, Jesus with everything and for everything, then he is with you through it all, and the decisions are easier to make. 
So the big thought for today is this. A lot of people will say, oh God, just show me exactly what to do and I'll do it. And God says to you, I'm not going to always show you exactly what to do, but I will give you wisdom to decide. Okay? So we're going to be looking at wisdom today in three points. Defining wisdom, refining wisdom, and then how do we gain or gaining wisdom. So what is wisdom? That's the definition. Defining wisdom, what is it? It isn't simply intelligence. It's not based on your IQ. Have you ever noticed there are a lot of smart people in this world that are not wise? Yeah. And wisdom is not inherited. Just because a parent or a grandparent is wise doesn't mean it genetically flows to the children or grandchildren. And not everyone is wise who is older. You've probably met some older people that you think, after years and years of experience, would have a lot of wisdom, but you think, hmm, they're still not so wise. Have you noticed that? Yeah. But wisdom is, I think, the biblical path toward making decisions. Wisdom is. So what is it? Okay. Okay. Um, And we're going to contrast what it's not again with the fact that there is a wisdom in this world. There is a wisdom in this world that looks wise to this world, but is not God's wisdom. And this is how Paul says it at the beginning of this letter in 1 Corinthians. He says, where is the wise man? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? In other words... To find wisdom is not simply by going out and getting experience in this world or asking just anybody in this world to figure out what's right or wrong. The value system of this world is such that even in the life of Jesus, some of the smartest, most learned people rejected him, threw him away. And even after his death and resurrection, the smartest and wisest and most religious people could not accept it. And Paul says, the foolishness of the cross is wiser than any human beings because God's mystery is how he does things is not the way we expect. So don't just look to wisdom by finding some huge leader that this world acknowledges, like some CEO or some politician, and wow, they must be wise. That's not necessarily the case, okay? So, from a biblical perspective, wisdom starts, wisdom begins with reverence. So, Proverbs 9, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the Holy One is insight. So, It's having an attitude, a perspective, a disposition. Wisdom is not about, like I said, IQ, but it's about, it's not something I possess, it's something that I am possessed by, it's something I am in relationship to because I'm in a position of reverence or awe or fear of God. We also notice, if you look through the book of Proverbs, which is probably one of the better places to say, what is wisdom? It contrasts the way of the wise to the way of the fool, time and again, all the way through the book. And after you read the whole book, a couple of times through, you kind of go like, okay, so, and this wouldn't be a bad study for you to do if you really want to understand what wisdom is, to look at the book of Proverbs and start saying, here are the qualifications, or here are the things that are associated with wisdom, and here are the things that are associated with being a fool. Okay? It's a good study, actually, okay? And um, so what we find here is the wise are humble. It's an attitude again. When pride comes, then comes dishonored, but with the humble is wisdom. And here, the wise are also teachable. Don't you love teachers out here when you have children who are teachable? Any of you have children who are unteachable? In your classroom? Yes, the professor says, I understand. I understand. We'll get to that. Yes, give instruction to a wise man and he will be wiser still. Teach a righteous man and he will increase his learning. He's going to be teachable. He's going to learn. And then um, the wise don't stop. They keep seeking knowledge. 
I love those who love me, and those who are diligent seek me will find me. That is when wisdom itself is being personified in chapter 9 and speaks this. So here's my definition of wisdom. It's not that deep, and it's probably too broad at this point in time, but we're going to refine it in a little moment. But that is wisdom is teachableness, is being willing to be taught and that you keep pursuing that the rest of your life. And there is never a time in your life when it's like, I'm, I'm done, I'm there. Anytime I start saying, I've got it down, I'm done, I'm there, I start the path of the fool. Okay? And you might go like, wow, that's really basic. It is, but I am surprised again and again how few people are actually following this way of wisdom. And like uh, Vicki, um, a professor in the College of Education, knows even education students aren't always following the way of wisdom. They're not always teachable. It's amazing in college, as well as I think this starts well before college, high school, grade school, somewhere, where children stop being teachable all of a sudden and they just think they know it all. Have you ever noticed that? And how, you know, when a teenager comes into your house, the parent's IQ has dropped 50 points just overnight. But they won't learn from any, and we just start, stop learning. And how many students in our whole system aren't there to learn? They are not there to grow in wisdom or even in knowledge, but they are there to get a grade. Right? And worse yet, most students in college today Like it or not, their focus is getting a job that pays a lot. So whatever I do for that, I really don't care to learn, but get me the grade to get the job. Do I care to grow in wisdom? Mm, If I do, I do, and if I don't, I don't. How many people out in the workforce start just getting into their routines and saying, this is the way we've done business, and this is the way we're going to do it, and this is the way it's going to go, and then complaining about, oh, I just can't believe how things are changing, and I just don't, and they refuse to change and refuse to grow, and they're starting the path of the fool instead of the path of the wise who keeps learning and can learn from, do you realize a fool will learn from no one and knows it all, him or herself. But the wise person can learn even from a fool. A wise person can learn from anyone and will keep learning in any situation. And like I said, I'm getting older. At some point, you'd expect me to be wise and you'd expect me to be balanced and all that stuff in life. But just getting older does not necessarily mean you get wise. And there are some times where I've seen older people in our society start feeling entitled to be listened to and entitled and say, hey, I've been around the... I've. That is already right there, that attitude that I can put on myself very easily is the way of the fool. It's not the way of the wise. Now, if we don't all feel a little cut down by this point in time, go like, oh my goodness, I've been following the way of the fool... I'd be surprised, okay? But wisdom, I know it's a basic definition, but I think it's important. And here's a couple of reasons, because I have seen over the years some people use super spiritual uh, understandings of how to make decisions. In fact, um, I recall when I was in college, I came home for the summer and worked a summer job, and we were listening to Christian radio as I was doing this landscaping job, and I listened to this woman um, describe how she was making a decision on how to buy a new car, and she really wanted the Lord to show her the exact perfect car that she should buy. And so she said she was going to, she said to God, I'm going to throw out a fleece. Anybody hear that biblical terminology before? And it's from the book of Judges where Gideon, who was um, called by God to be a judge, that is to be kind of a um, rescuer of Israel, um, was told by God what to do and didn't really want to do it, by the way. He didn't want to do it, so he says, I'm going to throw out a fleece, a fleece of a um, sheep, you know, sheepskin out on the ground. And God, if you could make the ground wet, no, if God, you can make the the ground dry, but the, the fleece wet, then I know you really want me to do it. Well, I don't think he was that smart because that's exactly what would happen if everything gets wet on the ground 
and then overnight, the dew dries up, the wool will stay wet longer than the ground. So that's what happened. He goes like, oh, wait a minute. (laughs) So he goes, now, tonight, we're going to do it the opposite way, because I think he was trying to get out of it. I don't think he really wanted to do God's will. If you kind of look in the life of Gideon, he was kind of the coward who wanted to get out. And so he says, okay, God, tonight the fleece is out. The fleece stays dry, the ground wet. That's what happened. Now, a lot of Christians I've heard use this example, I think, poorly in applying it to their life. And so she said she was going to throw out a fleece. Now, she didn't actually use a fleece. She was using her pet African gray parrot. That was her fleece. She said, Lord, I'm taking my parrot along with me to the used car lot. And whatever, whatever car the pet parrot, my pet parrot loves, I know that's the car you want me to buy. And so she took it to one car to the next, and it was kind of uncomfortable in this car. Went to the next car, didn't like this one. And finally, she said, I set it on the steering wheel of this car, and I can't remember the make and model. Probably a Pinto is what it was. If you don't know the story of Pintos, you can look it up. And she put, and she goes, and the parrot just started chirping away and seemed so happy and resting on the car. And besides, the car was red. It was the blood of Jesus red. I knew that was the car God wanted me to get. And she said, now my question with that is, was that a wise choice? I think she allowed her pet parrot to make the decision. And I'm not sure there's a Bible passage anywhere that says, use your parrot, and God promises that whatever the parrot wants is God's will. I don't see a Bible passage on that. And is she going to use that for who she dates? Is when she's going to buy a house, which house to get? What city to move to? I mean, do you understand what I mean? Okay, I think what it does is using that kind of understanding can keep me immature. I don't have to grow up then. I don't have to think through. I don't have to take responsibility. I can just blame it on my parrot and then on God that that's what happened. And then secondly, I think having that kind of understanding and not understanding biblical wisdom, it can also lead to a lack of accountability. Okay, it can lead to a lack of accountability. And what I mean by that is, have you ever had somebody come to you and say, you know, I think the Lord really spoke to me and I really need to do this. Have you ever heard that? How do you counter that? Do you understand? How do you say, "Um, I don't know if the Lord spoke to you and told you to do that. That doesn't sound like that's really wise. But the Lord spoke to me. And they usually don't mean the Lord verbally showed up in a dream or spoke to me. They usually just mean, I feel this. And really, I've seen Christian ease in this a lot of times where it's like, I just want to do this, but I'm going to use God to kind of, because I want to do, I really feel a need to do. But just then just say, you want to do it. Just you want to do it. But it leads me to never be accountable. I've heard pastors do that. It's really sad. I knew this pastor up in um, northern Florida that basically looked at his group of elders, the people who he was accountable to in his congregation and said, I'm not accountable to any human being. I'm just accountable to God. And it's like, yeah, that's a good way of basically being unaccountable. That is not wisdom. That is the way of the fool. And I know we like to super spiritualize it, but that means I'm the center of the universe and what I feel and what I want, that subjective means I'm making my decisions based on me. That is not the way of wisdom that we're talking about. The way of wisdom is the way of humility. The way of wisdom is teachableness. The way of wisdom is a posture of reverence towards God. And we'll get to how we gain that and when we make decisions that make sense. But that's defining wisdom. It's teachableness. It's acquired through years of following Jesus, being in community with other Jesus followers, and discerning and learning and growing and realizing God is with you throughout all of these things. Okay? Now let's refining wisdom, looking at this. So Paul, in 
1 Corinthians chapter 9 that we read has kind of a principle, a method, a a refining of why he does what he does. Okay? When we read 1 Corinthians 9 at the beginning, he says why he does what he does in this. We're going to get to that. Now, the Corinthian church, I don't know if I'd ever have wanted to have been the pastor of that church. It wasn't much larger, probably, than what we've got here this morning. It was a small church, but it was filled with a lot of know-it-alls. I mean, they were full of themselves and full of gifts and full of... They were wealthy in every way, he would say, but they were really full of themselves, and they thought a lot of themselves, and they edified themselves, and they took care of themselves. They didn't take care of others. Everything else, it's all me, myself, and I, church. And Paul talks about this just the chapter before 9, and he says, you know, knowledge, there's a lot of knowledge. We all possess knowledge. Knowledge can puff you up. But love builds you up. And he really kind of sets that. That itself is wisdom that he is sharing with them. You can know a lot of stuff, but that doesn't make you wise. In fact, you can be full of yourself. But when you decide to do things based on love, for the love of others, then you're actually building things up and it's going in the right direction. Okay? Okay? Now, in chapter 9, then Paul is using this kind of understanding of love, and he goes through a whole list of how he makes a decision. He says, when I'm around the Jewish people, I am like a Jew under the law to win those under the law. And when I'm around those who don't have the law, I live, in a sense, without the law, but still under the law of Christ to win. When I'm around the weak, I am weak. I am whatever, to whomever, in any way, and I do all of this, and he says, why? He does not say, I do all of this so a lot of people like me. I do all of this so my life is easy. I do all of this because he does all of this, he says, for the sake of the gospel. So everything he decides, everything he does, where he lives, where he's going to go, strategically what he's going to do next is all for the sake of the gospel. Now you might go like, oh, wait a minute. We use that word gospel all the time. What is the gospel? Right? What is it? So the Greek New Testament uses the word gospel or evangelism, or witnessing in one form or another, the word euangelizomai, the verb, 125 or so times. And it actually comes not just in, from the New Testament. It was used in the time of Paul, in the time of Rome, for any good news announcement of the birth of a king, of a victory in battle or anything else. And so good news, gospel, it's always an announcement. An announcement of something that is true and is for you and is yours, not because of anything you do. It's not something, the gospel is not something you do. It is something you receive, you hear, and it's a gift. So he does all this for the sake of this announcement, this gift, this good news. Paul will say in the book of Romans, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. It is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. Okay? For in it, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. As is written, the righteous shall live by faith. So there's certain words and certain things that are attached with the gospel. So it's the news, the reality that you are righteous, believing and trusting in Jesus Christ, you are declared right before God. It's not by what you do. It's not by what you've said. It's by what God has done for you in Jesus Christ. It's through his death, his resurrection, and the announcement that is a gift to you, and you go like, wow, it's mine. And everyone needs to hear it. Everyone needs to experience it. Everyone needs to have it lived out in front of them. And everyone needs to see it through some messenger. It doesn't come in the abstract. It always comes through a messenger. And it's a message that is shared and proclaimed and taught and given to others. 
And Paul says, I'm doing everything in my life. I'm arranging everything in my life for the sake of this announcement, this good news that everyone needs to hear and to believe. And so he decided, even though he could charge, he doesn't. He gives the gospel away freely, and he makes tents. Okay? And that's how he made his living. He decided wherever he would go, he would go specifically places nobody else had gone before. Sounds like Star Trek, I know. But he would go to places where the gospel had not been preached before because he wanted everyone to have that opportunity. So he does everything for the sake of the gospel. So his wisdom is to say to us, I think, that whatever you do, wherever you happen to be, it's not about your occupation. It's the fact that you, in that situation, are now, how are you going to glorify God Share the good news of Jesus Christ and display it with your life. What's going to work the best for the people around you, wherever you happen to be, however you happen to be? How are you going to, do, how are you going to glorify God and serve others in such a way that they hear and see the gospel through you? So for Thrive, why we do what we do, I think needs to be done for gospel expediency. What's going to make the most impact for the sake of the gospel, the good news that people need? There's enough bad news in this world. There's enough shooting on people in this world, but they need to hear about Jesus Christ, his death and resurrection for them, that they are saved by that grace that God gives and the announcement of that message and believing and trusting in him as their savior. They need that. They need that. There's no other message like it. There's no other gospel than that one. And that's the one that needs to be proclaimed everywhere in every way. So how are we going to do things? Are we going to make decisions based on what's easiest for us here at Thrive? Well, it's easier for us to do this than this. Not if it gets in the way of the gospel. Are we going to decide... Um, based on, well, we've always done it that way. I, I don't think we've hardly ever said that here. But I've been in a lot of churches that say that a lot. Are we going to do anything that's just because we can do it, we're going to do it, we've got the freedom to do it? No. We're going to take our freedom, and for the sake of loving others, we're going to do what we can in whatever way that's the most effective to reach the most people in this community and world. So when we're at FGCU, when we're in our community, wherever we are, how am I going to be a servant to them, sharing with them the gospel? That helps me clear up some of the decisions I make. Because it's really about the who I'm going to be, the messenger, the witness, and then the do follows. It's the why I'm doing it, and then the what comes about. And it's the whom I trust above all else. So how do you gain that wisdom? Okay? Just two simple ways we're going to talk about today. Okay? Real quick. You gain it by being in God's word. So your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. That's what um, Psalm 119 says. Notice it doesn't say your word is a spotlight to show me 15 years from now what's going to happen, but a lamp for my feet so I know where to step, one step at a time. I so often want to know 5, 10, 20 steps ahead. God, where... Uh, show me what I'm going to be in a year from now, how it's going to work, how this is going to work, how that's going to work. And it's like... I think God, if, if I did every, he'd go, why do you really want to know? Do you want to know because then you're in control of it, because you've got the knowledge of it, and that you can feel, or you want to know because you're going to trust me through that? Aren't you going to trust me anyways? So your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path, so I'm going to learn as much as I can from that. Some people will say, John, well, what's the future for Thrive? Where are you going to go with this ministry? And I believe in strategic planning, but I've also gotten that changed over time, whereas the strategic plan, I'm not, I mean, we're going to try to be faithful today. 
loving today, who we need to be today. And yes, we can talk about five years from now and 10 years from now what perhaps God wants us to do, but I'm not going to be presumptuous about those future plans as if the Lord is going to boom, 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 boom. We don't get a blueprint to follow. We get a person to become. Jesus. He's our wisdom from God. So, getting into God's word. Secondly, you gain wisdom from the wise. Proverbs 13, whoever walks with the wise becomes wise, but the companion of fools will suffer harm. So, who are you going to walk with? The wise. And what happens when you walk with the wise? You become wise. When you are a companion to the fools, what happens to you? You suffer harm. Just think about it. Somebody once said, and I think Craig Groschel said this, three guys in front of a pickup truck on the side of the road with a couple beers in there, nothing ever good came out of that. Because one of them is probably going to say, here, hold my beer, watch this. And you know they could suffer harm. I mean, it's just amazing. It's who you are around really does matter. Who you are learning from. And I love how it says in this passage, how it says in this passage, walk with. That is not like walk up to and leave. Hey, Kathy, I I really need some advice on this. Great, thank you, and then walk away. It's walk with, do life together, live with, be a part of. That's why we so emphasize here what we call home huddles, where you are gathered together with others who have together, hopefully, some collective wisdom. We're all needing to grow from each other. I don't expect to know everything, nor does anybody. We always grow from one another. And so I love the fact that we talk about walking with the wise together. There is so much during the day that you're around people who are following the way of fools, and you know it. They're buying into whatever our society is throwing at them to spend money here, to do this, to have fun, to consume this, to focus on self, 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 self. You deserve it. You should have it. You could do this. You could do all the time. You're getting that kind of advice from all, all over, from media to politicians to corporations to your neighbors to your coworkers. The whole thing, you're hearing a lot of foolishness. You need to walk with the wise to become wise. That's why I love the fact, I really want to see this happen in the near future, is that, that we start really mentoring in this, in this congregation. I know some of it has been going on, but we really need to step that game up. What I love is I know a number of older people who are wiser in this church, who are just dying to pour into those who are younger. And you know what I love too? We grow, I grow from that relationship. There's a thing called reverse mentoring where I'm actually learning how to use this from you all. How to, what do I do with my phone? You know, how do I even turn it on? Um, I learn so much from what the culture's going through, what the mindset is when I'm in those types of relationships. So it's a mutually beneficial thing. And I know many of the younger people in our congregation, from those in grade school, high school, and especially in college I've seen, and even into young adulthood, they're just praying for, wanting someone to come alongside of them to encourage them and to lift them up. We're going to need to get into that. If we want to walk with the wise to become wise, we need to be doing that. Too many congregations have overlooked the great wealth that God has given them in the members that they have by avoiding any talk about mentorship. And so your job has been to just throw a few bucks in the plate, warm that little seat, show up once in a while, and pray for your pastor. That is is not what we see in the Scriptures. Not at all. Walk with the wise and you'll become wise. You'll gain wisdom. Okay, a few questions to close and we'll pray. Okay? So we're coming up. Okay? (laughs) If the band was wondering where we're at, guess what time it is. Okay? (laughs) 
these are things I think that I want you to be thinking of this week and considering this week and working through. Okay, are you teachable? Are you open to the change? With whom are you walking right now? Who is walking with you? From whom can you learn? And what can you do this week so that you are on the path to gaining wisdom? Let's pray. Lord, you are such a good, good God, and you are the source of all wisdom and understanding. We thank you today that when we ask, show us just what to do because we just want to do the right thing, that you want us to grow in wisdom, to trust you above all else, to be with you, for you, above all else. And Lord, thank you that you will guide us and direct us and teach us and give us wise counsel and work in this body of Christ so that we all gain wisdom, each one of us. Lord, where there are clear words in your scripture that we are to obey, we will follow those. Where there are moral standards, we will live to those. Where there is freedom, as Paul talks about the freedom that he had, we want to make wise decisions for the sake of the gospel. Not simply based on what we like, but on what is going to be best for your kingdom and the kingdom growth in our area. We pray that that would happen here at Thrive. With each of us individually and corporately, the decisions we make, we make based on what is best for your kingdom, how we can glorify you the most, how we can serve others the most, how your gospel word can get into the life of others and transform them. Lord, the wisest thing anyone can ever do in this world is to trust you. Not to trust ourselves and be the fool, to think that we know it all, can handle it all, or fake our way through life, or follow our own path, but that we would trust you, that we would respond to your goodness and grace to that announcement and say, Lord, we are yours. And so for anyone here today, right now, Lord, that, well, has just never done that, has never trusted you, has never given you that control in their lives. Lord, for all of us who have foolishly <laughs> walked our own way so often and wandered, Lord, today I just ask that you would move in our hearts, that we would say yes to you by your Spirit. And I guess this is our opportunity with eyes closed and heads bowed that if there is anyone who has never said, yes, Lord. Lord, I need you to guide me, direct me. I trust alone in you. This is your time to do that. To just say, just raise your hand to your side and say, yes, Lord, right now, I am yours and you are mine. And thank you, Lord Jesus, that the way is not hard that your burden is light, your yoke is easy, and that you are humble of heart and receive anyone and everyone. And you want everyone to be yours. Lord God, I just pray for us in all the big decisions that many of us feel that we have, the choice that you've made is even more important. You chose, Lord Jesus, to follow your Father's will. You chose the nails. You chose our sin and shame. You chose our death. And you chose us in love. Thank you, Lord Jesus. And we pray, Lord, that the choices that we make would be done in that gospel, in response to that good news and that we would trust you fully and live for you completely. All this we pray in Jesus' name, amen.